Hi friends, it's September 29th, Friday. Happy Friday to you. Um, we are talking about a piece of legislation, AB 957, briefly, but also wanted to get in today to a topic about a lawsuit that involves some teachers in a public school relating to parental rights and gender identity. All that uh, with an interview with Michael Ramey of parentalrights.org. So this is a very interesting topic. Welcome to the front line with FPM, where we talk about California politics, homeschool freedom, parental rights, and the family. I'm your host, Nathan Pierce, and thanks for joining us today. Let's jump right in and see what's going on here on the front line. So I was really grateful to be able to interview Michael Ramey of parentalrights.org and he was able to share with me some of his thoughts on AB 957 which we are going to be doing a more detailed uh, podcast episode about next week probably. Um, but also uh, we wanted to talk about this uh, case, the Mirabelli case, which uh, revolves around two teachers in a public school and their uncomfortableness with being told to lie to parents. So uh, with that, let's get into the interview with Michael Ramey and uh, you can learn about what's going on in the parental rights world here in California on this issue. Um, doing okay, how are you? I'm okay. Recovered from the conference yet? Oh, no, I don't think so. Still yeah, working. Me I'm thinking maybe after this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I saw your email about uh, that had the reference to the 957 um, mm -hmm. thing, and I, I thought your, uh, I liked your summary of it. It was very concise. And uh, I appreciated the, uh, I don't know, the reference to it, kind of how ridiculous it is, the bill. Yes. Um, anyway, uh, I'm probably going to be doing, um, I'll be doing a sort of a more extensive uh, podcast on 957 next week. Okay. Um, so... Uh, if that's okay, I'd like to quote from that um, email. Did you have any other thoughts on that? Anything else? I, I mean, I'd be happy to um, have any other thoughts that you had on that, particularly with regards to, um, I don't know, in general, I think sometimes it's difficult for homeschool families to understand why, why, I talk about parental rights issues on when when I'm supposed to be dealing with homeschool issues, you know, and how, mm -hmm. where is the connect there? And um, so I, I was thinking because you're a parental rights organization, maybe it would help if, if you had any thoughts on why from your perspective, somebody that cares about homeschooling should care about parental rights in general what how does that matter for homeschooling does that does that make sense it does yeah well um rights in our country involve limiting the government uh and limiting the government's power so I and mean, that's what the constitution does and that's what our rights are about and so if the government has the authority to overstep parental rights in these other areas uh, for public school uh, parents or, um, you know, for child welfare cases, um, those who are struggling with poverty and being accused of neglect when they're doing their very best. Uh, if the government has the authority to step into the family for those things, then it has the authority to step into the family for for homeschooling and for Christian, uh, for Christian homeschoolers and conservatives as well. So I've likened it to um, I mean, 
And, and either side has the potential to be short-sighted on this, but it really comes down to, I'm not worried about that hole because that hole is in your end of the boat. Um, I mean, is really what it comes down to. We're in the same boat. And so we need to be, we need to focus on plugging all of the holes that we can, or the boat's going to sink. It's not like one end of the boat can sink and the other is going to survive. Yeah. Hmm. That's, that's a really good way to put it. Thanks for that. That's um, well, huh, kind of a sobering thing to think of it that way, but it's a good parallel because it, it is, it's that serious. I mean, it really is. And, and so many of us are saying, you know, well, I'm not going to worry about that because that hole's not in my end of the boat. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, wow. and I mean, there is there is some degree to which that's excusable if I am putting all of my effort into plugging the holes at my end of the boat. So I don't have bandwidth to plug the holes at, the, at your end of the boat. Um, but that's not generally the case. That's not generally what we're dealing with. We've got the bandwidth to, I mean, we need to see it all as one big picture, as one big boat, and and help each other. Yeah, instead of just patching our holes, keeping an eye on them, and with our other eye, look at the other end sinking and say, oops, too bad. Right. Too bad for you guys at your end. And because right. that's, yeah. short, like you said, short sighted, and it's not realizing that that end of the boat sinking is eventually going to take down our end. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good analogy. I like that. And that kind of leads into Mirabelli too. <laughs> yes. Because that's even more uh, along the lines of um, sort of transitioning from 957, which is sort of broader in a sense that it affects any family that's dealing with a custody dispute, right? And right. as that, that's just the immediate effect. I think long-term we could, we could look at it as, no, this is, this is, an indicator of a trajectory that's going to impact all all families right and it's it's gonna i mean it will weigh in family court period um right now it's custody cases but once that idea uh, goes into the family court um, then it's going to be anything that goes to family court um it's going to be you know whether or not your children are being taken away by by cps or, or whatever it might be um yeah 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 Okay, so so looking at looking at the Mirabelli case, and this is a this is a public school issue, right? I mean, <laughs> that's the situation. Um, yeah, this is at that end of the boat. <laughs> yeah. So so how do we how do we look at this Mirabelli case? First of all, is the outcome good or bad? Do we do we like this case? I mean. It seems like a bad situation that it started with, but ultimately, if 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 we're not, let's see, I'll say instead of we, I'll say if I'm not concerned about public school issues, again, how does this affect me, and and what and how uh, how how does this, what's the result of this? Okay, so a lot to unpack there. The case deals with. Um... The school system was forcing teachers to lie to parents about their children's names or pronouns or gender identity. So if my little boy, Charles, is going to school and wants to be called Charlotte and go by her, um, then they would call him Charlotte and, and refer to him as her uh, at school. Uh, but then when I'm talking with them, they would only refer to him as Charles and he. And so um, to keep me in the dark so I don't know what's going on in terms of the health and, and the welfare of my child. And so that's kind of the situation. And a couple of teachers were really uncomfortable with being put in a position of having to lie to parents. It violated their religious principles. Um, and so they sued. And uh, if I can just read one paragraph, the, sort of the summarizing paragraph from the case. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this goes toward... Uh, and then I'll unpack it some more, but it goes toward answering your question about why this matters to all of us. So it says, the school's policy is a trifecta of harm. It harms the child who needs parental guidance and possibly mental health intervention to determine if the in incongruence is organic or whether it is the result of bullying, peer pressure, or a fleeting impulse. It harms the parents by depriving them of the long recognized 14th Amendment right to care, guide, and make health care decisions for their children. And finally, it harms plaintiffs, this is to say those school teachers, 
who are compelled to violate the parents' rights by forcing plaintiffs to conceal information they feel is critical for the welfare of their students, violating plaintiffs' religious beliefs. Uh, so basically, it hurts everyone. It hurts the children, it hurts the parents, and it hurts the teachers who are forced to lie, uh, who have a religious uh, compunction against doing that. So, um, so really what it comes down to and why it matters to parents, even not in the public schools, is again, uh, we're in the same boat. If the government can lie to the public school students or public school parents about their students, then the government can lie to you. Um, mm. And, you know, they can hide things from you about your child. Now, right now, the most obvious contact point between a parent or a child, excuse me, between a child and the government is when you send your child to the public school. But if the government can lie to you about your child where they feel that it's uh, a health care issue, um, then there are other ways that they're going to be able to do that. It might be, um, you know, you go to get your child's medical records and now under HIPAA, uh, which is the, supposed to, which is a government law, a federal law to protect your child's privacy, uh, and you are the child's representative. So it's protecting your child's rep your child's privacy for you, not from you. Um, but that could change. If the government is allowed now to keep secrets from you about your minor child, uh, then then we could see that uh, that change. And I mean, there are already some troubling carve outs as far as HIPAA goes, and I probably shouldn't have started to open that can of worms. But <laughs> um, but I mean, it would just get worse if if the courts established that the government can lie to you about your child. Th then just take a moment, homeschool parent, and think about uh, how that could come up for you. Um, and and I'm sure you can think of you, you can imagine a scenario where the government has some information about your child and your child's health, and they're just going to keep it from you or lie to you about it. Wow. Yeah, I think I think it's really important for for people to connect all the dots between all these different areas of our lives because you can't really separate them out. The government doesn't. Um, right. So it's view of what authority uh, the government has. Yes, that's it. And historically, the Supreme Court has recognized a sphere of authority in the family that the government uh, shouldn't go into. And so the sphere of privacy, um, but the privacy the privacy bubble is not around the individual, it's around the family. Um, if the individual is the family, then certainly the sphere of privacy is around the is around the uh, the individual. And there are instances where you know an individual has a has a secret uh, that they don't want their whole family to know about, and the government has no business, you know, uh, uh, sharing other people's secrets. But as far as the government is concerned, uh, the parents are inside that that bubble. Uh, with the child. The parent is the child's legal representative. Uh, so you asked if this case is is good or bad for us. Um, it is good as far as it goes. Now, out there in California, you know that um, uh, Attorney General Bonta has been, uh, has sued the, is it Chino Valley, right? Great. Yeah. Um, school district. Um, because they put together a policy that says that parents cannot be kept in the dark. The teachers have to notify parents. Um and the attorney general there has said, no, that's against the law, that's wrong, and they've sued the school district, and they're claiming all kinds of privacy rights in the California Constitution that, that comes between uh, the parents and the child. Uh, the thing is, the Constitution is to limit the government, not to limit parents. That's true of the U.S. Constitution, it's true of the California Constitution. And so you can't pass a const you can't we at no point adopted a constitution that limits parents. Um, constitutions define government, not family. Right. And so um, the parents are inside that privacy bubble as much as Rob Bonta wishes it, they weren't. Um, and and so what this case is, this case was at the, uh, at the district court level as a federal case. And uh, so it's on a different plane right now than the, the Chino Valley case, which is in the California courts. Also, this isn't the ruling of the case. This is a ruling on an, an initial injunction um, to, to protect the teachers while the case continues forward. And what that usually, I mean, it's a, it's a very good sign because the court only issues these injunctions if they feel that, that that party who's asked for the injunction has a likelihood of winning their case. And in this case, the way they spelled it out, they didn't just grant the injunction, but they gave a, a pretty solid opinion that really tips their hand that they really favor the plaintiffs in this, um, that they not 
not favor in, in the sense of uh, an inappropriate bias, but in the sense that they they really believe the plaintiff's arguments. Um, yeah. yeah, so. Interesting. So, so, so in the long term, this is sort of a, this is temporary, this, this ruling that we have so far, this injunction, yeah. but, um, but we're given an idea of, at least at this point, where the court is leaning, and we're, we're, um, I guess, comforted by the fact that this court is currently, uh, if I understand correctly, the court is currently protecting the teachers from having to be in this awkward situation, right? Is that? That's, that's right. Yeah. So this injunction says that they can't um, enforce the rule that they have there, which is which would be to force the teachers to lie. So they okay. can't do that. They can't force the teachers to lie while this case uh, continues. Okay. Wow. That's um, it's going to be really interesting to watch this case and see if it sparks anything else, because I would imagine that there are other teachers um, that feel the same way um, that are um, in an awkward situation and would love to see this case be decided in the favor of teachers not having to lie to parents. Right. Yes. And certainly a lot of parents who, who do have their children in the public schools and don't want to be lied to. They want to know right. what's going on uh, with their with their children. We, I saw some polling just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was polling across six states um, and they broke it. They, the question was, should the government, should the schools be keeping this a secret from parents when it deals with the child's gender uh, identification or gender identity? And the number, the number opposed um, was somewhere in the mid 50%. Um, but, and I, I always set this up. I'm, I'm setting you up. Okay. I'll confess it. Um, but that is only self-identified Democrat voters. So, so in other words, a majority of self-identified Democrat voters oppose keeping the secret from parents. Now, when you get to the self-identified conservative or Republican voters, their numbers in the 90s. It's like 93 percent are opposed. Um, I don't think that's really a surprise, uh, but the surprise and uh, and I think one that lawmakers really need to pay attention to is that a majority of Democrat voters um, are are opposed to this as well. And I tell you, my theory on this and I'm not a great political theorist, but my theory on this is really simple. Uh, a lot of these voters have kids. And that's it. If you're a parent, you don't want people keeping secrets from you about your child's health and welfare, period, because you know you love your child more than anybody else. You know your child the best, and you can't trust anybody to make the right decision for your child uh, more than yourself. And that doesn't mean we always get it right, and it doesn't mean we're always perfect. I want advisors to help me make decisions for my child, mm -hmm. but when it comes down to it, who is most inspired and driven to make a good choice for my child? And it's me. Right. And so, you know, even a majority of self-identified Democrat voters are saying, no, you don't keep this stuff secret from me. That's my child and I'm the one to protect them. So, yeah, yeah. So um, I really appreciate you laying that out. And um, I wanted to give you a minute too to uh, explain uh, what what your job is too and uh, what your uh, uh, position is and um, what the purpose of your organization is. So could you could you um, speak to that for, for a minute? Sure. So I've been with parentalrights.org uh, for 15 years, since 2008. It was formed in 2007 uh, with the aim of passing a parental rights amendment to the U.S. Constitution to take the fundamental liberty interest that the Supreme Court has recognized for 100 years and put it right there in the black and white. Uh, and this is uh, because the Supreme Court changes, um, and we don't want to reach a point, whether it's 10 years from now or 200 years from now, where the Supreme Court no longer recognizes parental rights. So if we put them in the text of the Constitution, uh, then they're protected. So the organization was founded in 2007. I came on board in 2008 as the Director of Communications and Research. Uh, in 2017, uh, well, let me back up. In 2014, the Parental Rights Foundation was founded, and that's um, – the difference being that the uh, parentalrights.org was a political organization. Uh, donations are not tax deductible. It's a 501c4. The Parental Rights Foundation is uh, policy and education. And so we do a lot of deal with a lot of the same information, um, but we're you know not so much lobbying. And so those 
that's a 501c3. Donations are tax deductible, um, which just made, honestly, just was a practical move to make it easier to fund the work that we're doing that's so important. Um, so in 2017, there was a, a lot of turnover, and I became the, uh, the executive director. And then just earlier this summer, in, in June, uh, I was elected the president of Parental Rights Foundation and ParentalRights.org. And the heartbeat of our organization, very simply, is protecting children by empowering parents. Uh, so that's what we're about uh, at the federal level, at the state level. Um, of course, the Parental Rights Amendment is a really huge undertaking that's uh, it, it's going to take a while, especially with the dysfunctional Congress we have. Uh, so in the meantime, we looked around and said, OK, where can we apply the same principles and make a difference right now today for as many parents as possible? And we found it at the state level, largely um, passing uh, laws that say that parental rights are fundamental um, and demanding that the courts give them strict judicial scrutiny. Um, in some states, we've managed to see past uh, parents' bill of rights that really spells that out more in detail. Uh, in Oklahoma, Florida, and Georgia are a couple of a few examples of that. So um, we're we're pursuing the same principles uh, at the state and at the federal level to protect children by empowering parents through good law. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the work you're doing there, and um, I'm grateful to be able to have have you discuss some of these California specific things with us uh, today. And I think, <laughs> I guess, uh, California being as special as we are, you probably have to deal with a lot of uh, California news on your plate. Uh, yeah, we've tried to weigh in on as many of those things as we can to try to, you know, stem the tide of the, there's just kind of an anti-family attitude there in the California legislature. And um, you know, I meet wonderful people from California. I know it's not the entire state. In fact, geographically, I think it's it's a, a small portion of the state, uh, though, you know, those small portions contain a lot of people. I, I get how that works. But um, so, yeah, but there there have been a number of issues we've weighed in on in the last few years. Um, a few senators and, and assemblymen out there we know by name and as, you know, oh, this is from him. It's, it's another, you know, it's going to be bad news. So, uh, and we weigh in as much as we can and urge them to uh, use a little common sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, and uh, I guess uh, if people want to learn more about uh, parentalrights.org, they can go visit your website, which, no surprise, is parentalrights.org. Right. Well, and the, and uh, also parentalrightsfoundation.org is uh, okay. actually parentalrights.org is really focused on that constitutional amendment. Parentalrightsfoundation.org is where they'll find uh, all the state level stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Frontline with FPM. For more information about the topics we discuss here, check out Family Protection Ministries at fpmca.org and subscribe to our channel.